just a quick disclaimer. Uh, I'm going to go through equipment and show you some of the stuff that I have. That's just stuff that I have and stuff I've acquired over the years. Don't go buying equipment just because you see it on the table here. It's probably not the best option out there for you, cost-wise or performance-wise. I haven't bought a rifle in years. Um, the, I will give you some guidance later on on what I think you should buy if you're getting into starting into long-range shooting. All right, and the goal would be performance at a decent price where you're not getting ripped off. All right, so uh, let's get to it. The first segment I want to do, I want to talk about equipment. I'll go through optics and rifles and spot and scopes and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and again, don't go buying equipment because you see it on the table here, unless I say, hey, this is a great piece of kit and you, you need to get this. All right, <clears throat> I want to show you where we started. And when I went to, uh, Sniper school in Ireland in the 1980s. Uh, we had uh, Accuracy International 308s with, uh, I think we had Schmidt and Bender scopes back then. But uh, when I went back to sniper school in 2007 in uh, special operations, really nothing had changed. The equipment was the same, the bullets were the same, and the, the rules that we had for shooting in different weather conditions and all that, it was very theoretical and we captured every shot we took on a data book. That has all changed. And it changed over the, over the period from about 2008 to about 2012. It changed in that four years more than it changed in the, in the 50 years before that. So this is kind of where we were in, when I went to sniper school in 2007 at the beginning of the change. This is a Remington 700 308. All right, this is Mike's rifle. Um, this is actually a very accurate rifle, uh, back when Remington used to make really good rifles, but a uh, 308 bolt gun, a lot of police units use it, the military use it, Marine Corps used it, the Army, um, but it's got some drawbacks. The scope has got some real drawbacks, and we've come a long way since then, all right? So let's go from the, the rear to the front and talk about some of the, the pros and cons. You'll notice right away, it's got this leather piece attached. And that's to give you a little more cheek rise. Um, what we used to have to do in school, once you're lining up your, your eye with the optic at the back, you would have to take SAM splints and build up a cheek piece to make it perfectly level so you're not straining your neck to look through the optic and you've got the proper eye relief. And we'll go through that later on. It has no length of pull, which means if your eye is not perfectly lined up for um, eye relief, then you have to move the scope forward and back. And you've only got so much movement. Okay, um, this is a three and a half to 10 power second focal plane scope, which there are pros and cons to that, and we'll talk about that later on. Uh, it's got a Milbot reticle. It's got, if you look on this side, it's got no parallax knob, which is a huge problem. Elevation on the top, windage on the side, um, kind of old school. The, um, as we move forward, the, the barrel is free floating, but it does touch the rail, a lot, not the rail, but the, the chassis a lot. If you run a, you should be able to run a piece of paper underneath that barrel all the way, but you generally can't. And what you'll see if you separate this barrel and this action from the, uh, the, the chassis, you'll see rubbing and uh, you'll see where every time this gun's been shot, it's been rubbing against the, uh, the chassis, which causes inaccuracy. So what guys will do, they'll separate them, they'll look where the rubbing is and they'll sand it down to make sure there's nothing touching. This is a short barrel, it's got no muzzle break which really does help with recoil. It's not made to take a suppressor, which is a huge part of sniping now for um, um, signature reduction. It's got a cheaper bipod that does not cant left and right. It's got no uh, level on it. So again, not too long ago, this was pretty much the best thing out there. Um, it's got a fixed magazine that I can't detach and if you've ever tried to run down the middle of a street in Baghdad in a gunfight and reload this thing, not pretty, okay? So kind of like to have a magazine I can take out and, and put in and reload very, very quickly, all right? So that's kind of the old school Remington 700, still a good rifle, still a lot of fun to shoot, but uh, not as user friendly as, as it could be. Now we jump forward and once we get into the war on terror and we started seeing a lot of our gaps, our capability gaps, both in special operations and in the military. We, uh, we upgraded to a gas gun for urban fighting, and we upgraded um, our bolt gun 
to the uh, 2010, which Remington won the contract on, and that was a 300 wind mag. So I have, this is a, a kind of a civilianized version of that 2010 that the military used. It's got a couple of different features, but it's, it's pretty much the same rifle. It's 300 wind mag that gave us much better ballistics and was specifically sought after for long range engagements in Afghanistan um, because you need to have overmatch on the enemy. If, if you're a guy with an AK-47 and a little training, you kind of got to maneuver to within a couple of hundred meters to shoot at me. Well, if I can kill you at 1,000 meters or 1,500 meters, then it gives me stand off and overmatch. So let's look at what was fixed on this compared to that older one. If you look at the chassis, this is a Rax chassis. Um, it's a very uh, adaptable chassis, okay? So if you look, I can, I can adjust length of pole. I can adjust that, that shoulder piece or that... that the uh, shoulder piece up and down. <clears throat> I can adjust my cheek to stock well up and down and make it perfect and lock it into position. All right. It, um, it has a folding stock, which makes it, I'm not carrying this rifle in combat as a rifle. It's a bolt action. It's World War I technology. What I'm doing is I'm folding the stock and I'm putting it in a backpack and I'm carrying a carbine to get in and out of my target. And then when I get in in a, in a static position, I'll, I'll put it into action and I'll be able to reach out and touch people at long distance, all right? So good cheek to stock well, good length of pull. Uh, it's got a rail all the way up um, on the ch chassis. And this is for, uh, on the front here, I would put night vision optics and I turn this day scope into a night scope, okay? We used to have the PVS-10, which was a day scope and night scope kind of integrated. The problem is it was big and it was bulky. And if I, if I took off a day scope and put that on for night, I had to re-zero. Whereas now I don't have to re-zero, I just threw on a night optic in the front and I can go to work. Um, the fantastic trigger, a detachable magazine for this so I can carry multiple mags and reload more quickly if I have to. Uh, multiple rail spaces here for lasers and stuff. Uh, free floating barrel. Um, muzzle brake on the front to dissipate the gas and make the, the recoil. This thing shoots like a 22, believe it or not. Very accurate gun. Um, good bipod. It's got a Harris bipod. It gives me the ability to cant left and right, which gives me the ability to keep the, uh, the gun perfectly level. It's got a level built in aftermarket. And um, this gun's a hammer. It shoots really, really well, but it's very, very heavy. And uh, it's more for a static position than, than running and gunning in a city. I would, I would employ this in an urban, uh, I'm sorry, in a rural environment only. Um, if you look at the optic, this is the new optic for SOCOM. It's a 7 to 35 Night Force ATAC R with um, a Trimmer 3 reticle in it. We're going to talk about reticles here in a little while, but probably the best optic on, on the market right now. Expensive but uh, absolutely fantastic optic. If you look at the mount, it has a one-piece mount, um, and it has a diving board mount here in the front, which you can put a, a, an illuminator on it, you can put a laser like a Wilcox Raptor on it, and then you can zero that laser to your crosshair, so it makes it easier, easier to uh, range a target. Um, it, it's a tremor through reticle, 0.1 IMRAD for elevation, windage, um, Parallax knob right here. We're going to talk about parallax here in a little bit. Um, it goes all the way from 7 power on the low end to 35 power on the high end. That's a lot of magnification. There are drawbacks from having uh, that much magnification, mainly heat from the barrel or from the suppressor if you're running one, and you get a lot of mirage. And, and if it's a very warm day, it's hard to see sometimes. But just because you have 35 power, it doesn't mean you have to use it. So fantastic scope, just because you have 35 power doesn't mean you have to use it. And we're going to talk, talk about scopes here a lot in, in, in a few minutes. Just on a quick note, this has a, a torque wrench adapter as opposed to a, a QD adapter. And people go back and forth and opinions are varied. But um, when I worked in Force Mod for Special Operations, uh, there were a lot of testing done. And... The, the labs that do that testing in the control environment found that a torque wrench, torque to the proper specs is more consistent. Picatinny actually did a test because 
This is the mount that uh, goes on the Army 2010 that soldiers were using, and they were complaining that their optic was coming loose. And they put it on their high-speed camera, and they filmed it, and they had the old T-handle torque wrench, and it was clicking and locking in and breaking at the right torque, but it was backing off the, the, the nut very, very slightly after it locked it in. So they've gone to this one, which is a different versions, uh, different version, Sikoni precision, precision Tools, and I got one of these, and this kind of breaks a little differently, so just something to think about. Um, suppressors, the, the 2010 for the military has a suppressor on it now. Again, signature reduction is not necessarily noise, it's more flash and uh, kind of hiding that signature when you're in hide sight. So this muzzle brake is fantastic, makes the gun really steady, it gives you the ability to see that second shot correction, see that impact so you can make a second shot correction. Problem is it, it, it's a big flash, especially at night time. So um, suppressors have, have really are really prevalent now. This one right here, This right here I have on multiple guns. It's uh, the LaRue um, Tranquilo. It's a great suppressor, it's a little bulky, but for the size and weight, it, it's actually pretty good. And all I did was put a different, uh, the same brake on my 5.56, my 308, and uh, I can bounce it back and forth, okay, and use it on multiple systems. So we talked about the development of guns in the war on terror. And we, we quickly figured out that when we're running and gunning or in an urban hide in uh, Baghdad or one of the cities in Iraq, that a bulk gun with an internal magazine is not ideal. So we put the solicitation out for a gas gun. And um, special operations were already using the SR-25, which is a Knight's Armament gun. And the Army kind of follows suit with the M110 SAS. All right, not the, not the best gun out there, but it did fill the gap. Now. The conventional wisdom was that you could never get a gas gun to shoot as well as a bolt gun. Um, this is an old school OBR that I got years ago. And this thing shoots as well as any gas gun or bolt gun I've ever had. It'll shoot sub minute of angle all day long. It, it's an absolute hammer. Um, but it gives you the advantage of being able to fight in an urban environment with this if I have to. Now it's big, it's bulky. I'm not a huge guy and I don't like carrying this as my primary. I would still backpack this into an urban environment and carry a carbine uh, to get in and out. But if I had to break contact and move quickly, I could, uh, I could use that for this. The other advantage of a gas gun over a bolt gun is firing in alternate positions. I don't have to break my position each time to rack a bolt. Um, I can just get up there, get locked in and, and, and let it eat, all right? And I have 20 round mags I can, I can uh, replace my ammunition really, really quickly. Again, continuous rail, free floating barrel. This one's got a shofar brake on it, by, uh, Harris bipod, uh, fantastic trigger on this thing. But again, did not have enough elevation on the cheek piece to get up to the optic perfectly. So I had to build it up with SAM splints and tape and wrap it. But I, I've got it set perfectly for me now and I'll probably never ever take it off. Um, you've got a little bit of length of pull and, uh, but for what it is, um, gas gun's a great option. Now, this is a 308. A 6.5 gas gun is a better option. And uh, we're going to talk about ballistics a lot. And uh, SOCOM is going to a 6.5 gas gun as a sniper support weapon. So the advanced sniper rifle will be three calibers, 308, 300 Norma Magnum, 338 Norma Magnum. And then that sniper support weapon will be a 6.5 Cree bore. Um, so that gives a, a lot of reach and a lot of standoff to, to both guys. Again, don't go buying stuff just because you see it on the table here, just what I have. So this is a Surgeon 308, um, absolute hammer, short barrel. It's got a suppressor on it. It's got a range finder on it. It's got a diving board mount. It's got a, uh, a level on one side. Um, and it's got, a, uh, it's got a cheek to stock weld, but it's also got this pad on there. Um, extremely accurate gun. Folding stock can fold up real small into a small bag for, for moving in and out. It's got an AI uh, chassis on it as well. 
but um, kind of an old optic, but still very, very effective gun, all right?